from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi. My name is John Kelly. I'm a columnist at the Washington Post, and I wanted to welcome everybody here on behalf of the Library of Congress uh, to the 2013 National Book Festival. It's my pleasure to introduce a couple people. In the afterword to the novel that uh, we're going to talk about today, Nine Days, Fred Hyatt writes about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. In his case, that was getting hit in the leg by a tear gas canister fired during a demonstration in Korea in 1987. But I think more often Fred has been in the right place at the right time. He and his wife, Pooh Shapiro, headed the Washington Post's Tokyo Bureau in the late 1980s, a very interesting time to be in Japan. They next went to Moscow in time to watch the collapse of the Soviet Union. Fred became editorial page editor of the Post in 2000, and if you read the papers at all, you know that a lot has happened since 2000 uh, to write about. Fred has always trained his sights beyond fact and beyond opinion. His first novel, The Secret Son, was published in 1992. He's written two books uh, for children for ages four and up, If I Were Queen of the World and Baby Talk. And I read Baby Talk, and some of the dialogue in it is, wah, the baby wails, wah, wah, the baby cries. And I thought maybe Fred could repurpose that, just put Congress in for baby, and he'd have a, a third book. Uh, in April, Random House published Nine Days, Fred's young adult novel about a teenage boy and girl from Bethesda who set off for Asia to rescue the girl's father when he disappears during a trip to Hong Kong. The book was inspired by the true story of Tiana Wong, the daughter of a Chinese dissident who was sentenced to life in prison 11 years ago. Please welcome Fred Hyatt and then Tiana Wong. Thank you, John, for a very nice introduction. And thank you, everybody, for coming. I really appreciate it. This is a great event, and it's a huge honor to be part of it for me. Um, I have to say it's even more of an honor because the Librarian of Congress is here right now, uh, James Billington. It's a little intimidating. Uh, for those of you who don't know, in addition to all the amazing things he does at the library, uh, he wrote what is still the most insightful book uh, I think has ever been written about Russia. It's always intimidating to be in his presence. Fortunately, I'm not talking about Russia today. So. Even more intimidating is that uh, my children's fourth grade teacher is here. <clears throat> this is a teacher who, at the beginning of the year at Parents' Night, informed us that we all had to bring four old tennis balls in because she insisted that the kids put tennis balls underneath the leg of each chair because she didn't like any squeaking noise when they backed up. And I still get nervous when I think about that. Uh, she turned out to be the greatest teacher they had in uh, Somerset Elementary School. <clears throat> so thank you for coming. Um, <clears throat> I thought uh, I would talk a little bit today about fact and fiction, um, which you might have some reason to think I'm a little bit confused on. Uh, after all, one of the two lead characters in my book, Nine Days, is named Tiana, and she is a work of fiction. But there is unquestionably a real Tiana sitting here. Moreover, I have spent most of my life and still spend most of my days as a journalist, reporting facts and sifting true claims from false. Now, I know from some of the fan mail I get at the Post, uh, not everybody thinks I do. I can tell true from false in my day job either, but we can talk about that in the question and answer period. But Nine Days is a novel. If I were reviewing it, I'd say it's a funny, exciting adventure story, a moving tale of friendship between an unlikely pair of teenagers. Unfortunately, nobody has asked me to review my book yet. But, and yes, one more but, Nine Days is partly inspired by true events. And writing this novel has brought me closer to the real Tiana, and to the reality of her father's imprisonment than I ever would have come as a journalist. So to try and untangle all of this, 
I want to tell the story of three women, two of whom were in tears when I met them, in three very different places and times. The first is a woman I encountered in Seoul, Korea in 1987, a chambermaid at the Seoul Hilton Hotel, to be precise. I had flown to Seoul as a foreign correspondent for the Washington Post. It was my first overseas assignment, and I arrived a bit earlier than I expected because the country, or had planned, because the country was suddenly in tumult. Students were protesting against the general who ran the country and demanding democratic elections. When I landed at the airport, the reporter I was replacing wished me luck, handed me a present, and flew off to Washington. The present was a gas mask. So the next morning, I took a cab to Seoul National University, and as John mentioned, made a real rookie mistake. I let myself get caught between the students who were flinging Molotov cocktails and the heavily padded riot police who were shooting tear gas back at the students. Some photographers might dare sneak into that no man's land, but no print reporter would be so stupid except me. Sure enough, I got thwacked by a tear gas canister fired by the police. Luckily, it hit me not in the head, where it really could have done some damage, but in the leg. I ended up with a nasty welt, all in all a cheap price for a fairly valuable lesson. But that night, without thinking about it, I put my pants in the laundry and my shoes outside the door. Both were covered in tear gas powder. The next morning, when the maid knocked at my door and handed me my shoes, nicely polished, there were tears streaming down her face. Of course, I felt like a total jerk. Fast forward four years, my wife have just landed in Moscow. <clears throat> my wife and I have both just landed in Moscow for our next assignment. And again, we've come earlier than expected because again, we're landing in a country in turmoil. This time, hardliners in the Soviet Politburo have launched a coup to try to depose Gorbachev and stop his reforms, his perestroika and glasnost. Boris Yeltsin is resisting them in the Yeli Dome, the White House, as it was called in Moscow, in the name of democracy. And thousands of Muscovites have surrounded his office to keep the tanks at bay and try and defend reform. The, the, the standoff lasted three days, three very tense days. But on the fourth, the coup plotters gave up. Yeltsin emerged victorious. And thousands of triumphant demonstrators marched down the main avenue to the Kremlin. I walked with them. And when we reached St. Basil's Cathedral, I saw a middle-aged woman crying, and I asked her why. She told me that the last time she had walked across Red Square, it had been as a young pioneer, when she was a seven-year-old marching on May Day wearing her little red scarf. On ordinary days, nobody was allowed in Red Square, which was roped off to everybody but the limousines of the apparatchiks driving in and out of the Kremlin. The woman told me she had never, since that day as a little girl, again crossed Red Square. And she'd never again expected to stand on these cobblestones, certainly not as a free woman. And she was overcome with emotion. I tell these two stories for a couple of reasons. In both places, I knew, even as I was covering these events, that I was watching history being made. In Korea, in the six months after that first ill-fated demonstration, the protests spread from the universities to downtown Seoul. The students were joined by their parents, and in the end, the generals allowed a free election. Korea was on the road to democracy. In Russia, over the next three months, Gorbachev, fatally weakened even though he had survived the coup, saw his power steadily ebb away toward Yeltsin. And that December, 1991, the Soviet Union ceased to exist. The div the div divergent histories of these two countries since, and of many others that have fought to become free, speak to how hard and complicated that road can be. But one thing I saw in both places is not complicated at all, even if it may not be so easy to explain. That is how fiercely people will struggle to be free and how much they will sacrifice to win their liberty, even against huge odds even when they know their struggle is likely to go unnoticed by most of the world, even when it seems by any rational measure doomed from the start. I've tried to keep those people and people like them in mind in my journalism ever since. And they figure in nine days too, 
<clears throat> where the quest for political freedom becomes very personal and very dangerous. And it becomes dangerous not just for the freedom fighter, the father character who you never meet in the book, but for his loved ones also, which in turn I think makes the moral calculus a bit more complicated after all. But these stories of these two women also help explain why I turn to fiction. In my reporting for the Post, I never wrote about the woman in the Seoul Hilton. The woman in Red Square became just one bloodless paragraph in the middle of one of hundreds of stories I wrote from Russia over four years. Yet I remember both of them as sharply as anyone I covered and wrote about in those countries. I've wondered whether the cleaning woman, when she knocked on my door that day in tears, but not apparently angry, just wanted me to know what a thoughtless jerk I'd been, or whether there was some other message, whether she had some view on the turmoil that was racking her nation. I've wondered whether her life changed in any way as South Korea became more democratic, or whether she kept on shining shoes and making beds, unaffected by the upheavals around her. And I've wondered how the women in Red Square weathered the dramatics ups and downs of Russian history in the two decades since, and how she feels when she looks back on that hopeful moment in August 1991. If I were a better journalist, maybe that day I would have gotten her phone number, stayed in touch, written her story again over the years. But as it is, their lives exist as complete stories only in my own imagination. The third woman, <clears throat> The one who helped inspire this book most definitely was not in tears when we met. Tiana Wong was a 19-year-old between high school and university when she submitted an op-ed to the Washington Post about five years ago now about her father, who was and is serving a life sentence in China just for being a democracy activist. I was struck by the guts it took for her to move to Washington for a year, knowing no one, to try to bring attention to her father's case. And I was struck by the eloquence of the essay that she submitted, which was a beautiful piece. I asked if she would meet. And over tea in the lobby of the Madison Hotel up the street, she filled in more details of her story and of his. I didn't meet her again for three years. But that summer, after we met, I began working on a novel about two Washington teenagers, a boy named Ethan and a girl named Tiana, who fly off to Hong Kong to find her father when he disappears and when they realize that nobody else is going to do anything about it. I borrowed not only Tiana's name, I also bar borrowed from her father's dramatic story in shaping the mystery that my two pro protagonists have to solve. I did all this without asking Tiana's permission. And since I'd met her only that one time, my Tiana was a totally different person, or so I thought. <clears throat> there was an exhilaration for me as a journalist to allowing these fictional characters to take form and develop their tics and traits and histories, turning them loose to see how they would respond in a dangerous world, watching their friendship be tested, teeter, emerge stronger, and all of this without interviewing a single real person. But I was turning them loose in the real world, in places I had come to know as a foreign correspondent, but could try to bring to life in a novel differently than I could in a newspaper the dazzle of the harbor in Hong Kong, the farmer puttering into Hanoi on his motorbike bike with his harvest on his back, the smells and sounds, the disorientation of being in a foreign place, the joys of finding connections in that foreign place. In the end, I found fiction to be not an alternative to reality, but a different way from journalism to give reality a shape and to bring to fuller life a few of the characters I'd met and glanced off of as a reporter. When an editor from Delacorte at Random House expressed interest in the manuscript, I sent it to Tiana. <clears throat> if she'd objected, of course, I wouldn't have proceeded. But she said, OK. And over the past year, I've gotten to spend a fair amount of time with her and to learn a lot more about her story and her father's story. So for better and worse, I'm back in the real world. In this world, I can't write an ending that sets her father free nor one that frees Tiana from the burden of fighting for her father's freedom. As infuriating as is the father's predicament in nine days, the imprisonment of the real Wang Bing Zhang is far more so. 
And as interesting as I find my fictional Tiana, the real one turns out, again, to be more so. Any small step she achieves in bringing attention to her father's case provides more satisfaction than fiction ever could. And when her real father finally comes home, no novel will be able to compete. I hope to write that story for the Washington Post. Meanwhile, it's my fictional Tiana that I'm left wondering about. What's become of her since she and Ethan made it back from Asia? At some point, if I get curious enough, I may have to sit down at my computer to find out. Thank you. Hi. My name is Tiana, and the story that Fred wrote is a work of fiction, but some of the details and situations are based on truth, so I will tell you a little bit about the history behind the book. Like the fictional Tiana, I was named in commemoration of the Tiananmen Square Massacre. But instead of growing up in Bethesda, I was actually born and raised in Montreal. I was 19 years old when I met Fred at the Madison Hotel. It was 2009, the year I had graduated high school, and instead of going to university, I decided to move to Washington uh, from Canada by myself. My father, Wang Bingjiang, is a political prisoner serving a life sentence in China, and I thought um, lobbying for his release in DC might help win his freedom. You see, my father was a medical doctor who came to North America to do a graduate degree in experimental medicine. When he graduated in 1982, he was the first Chinese national to have obtained a PhD from a Western university since the founding of the People's Republic of China. He could have returned to his homeland and enjoyed a distinguished career as a medical doctor and researcher, and probably later as a high-ranking bureaucrat. But instead, he pursued his deepest conviction. My father believed that the Chinese people deserved a democracy ruled by law and that he could help achieve it. So he founded the Overseas Chinese Democracy Movement. For 20 years, my father worked towards this dream of a democratic China. He started a dissident magazine, founded several opposition organizations, and traveled the world giving speeches to inspire people to share his ideals. In doing so, my father would face unthinkable challenges and setbacks and sacrifice everything, including eventually his own freedom. On June 27, 2002, my father was traveling in Vietnam when he suddenly disappeared. For six months, my family had no idea where he was. And China denied having any information about his whereabouts. And finally, in December, the Chinese government admitted to having him in custody. Later, we learned that he had been in Vietnam having lunch with fellow activists when he was kidnapped. Beaten and blindfolded, he was forced into China where he was arrested by Chinese authorities. He had been charged with espionage and terrorism. And in early 2003, my father was given a one-day trial held behind closed doors, during which he was not allowed to speak, no evidence was presented, nor any witnesses called. He was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Since then, has, my father has been serving his sentence in a tiny cell in southern China. He is kept largely in solitary confinement and has very little contact with other inmates. He also has very limited contact with my family because the prison only allows one 30-minute um, visit a month. And these visits are held in visitation booths and conducted so that we're actually separated by um, plexiglass and metal bars and we can only speak on the phone. Um, during these visits, there are four guards monitoring our conversation and one guard videotaping the meetings. And because most of my family lives in either the United States or Canada, it's becoming increasingly difficult to keep up with these monthly visits. But more problematic is the fact that many members of, a, of my family, including my mother and myself, are consistently being denied visas to go visit him. In fact, I haven't been able, um, I haven't been allowed to visit my father for five years now. Um, since his imprisonment, 
my family has worked tirelessly, tirelessly to try to win his freedom. With the assistance of lawyers, fellow activists, and friends, we have tried to bring um, his case to the attention of the international community. That's why I came to DC in 2008 um, to try to work with human rights organizations, lobby the American government, and speak to the media about my father's plight. Submitting an op-ed to the Washington Post was one way I had hoped to share our story, and that's how I met Fred. And I've also appealed for his release in Ottawa, G Geneva, Brussels, and elsewhere. But despite our best efforts, the past decade of my father's imprisonment has been marked largely by a sense of defeat. It's difficult to describe the challenge of trying to win the support of the American and Canadian governments, and the helplessness I feel when confronting an adversary as formidable as the Chinese government. It's even harder to talk about watching my father lose his mind and health in solitary confinement. Overwhelmed by disappointment, I'm always struggling not to give up, move on with my life, and leave my father's fate to destiny. So when Fred told me he was working on this book, I not only felt gratitude, but a small sense of achievement. I thought if his work of fiction had been even faintly inspired by elements of my family's tragedy, then perhaps my efforts had succeeded in creating little ripples of awareness, and more importantly, that my father's sacrifice had not been in vain. What's even more encouraging is the renewed attention Nine Days has brought to my father's case. Um, since the book's publication, I've been able to tell my father a story on platforms I previously never dreamt possible. I certainly wouldn't be here talking to you today. And so the support that has followed Nine Days' release has really given me the courage I needed to continue calling for his release. It's intimidating to be fictionalized into a young heroine who is smarter and more courageous and poised than I could ever be. But what I learned from the events that, had fo that has followed the book's launch is that while reality can inspire a writer to write fiction, fiction can also influence how we shape reality. By creating a bold, fictional Tiana, Fred has inspired me to be more like her. So, fueled by the energy and daring of her in nine days, I will continue to advocate for my father's release until he is free. The next chapter of my own life will be a magical blend of reality and fiction, and it is something for which I am very grateful. Thank you. She writes the nonfiction book. It will put nine days to shame, and it'll be a great book. Um, questions um, if, about the real the reality or the fiction or either side of it. I have to tell you one awkward thing is that when I was writing the book, the character I thought was Tiana, and when we actually got to know each other, she told me that it's Tiana, and I said, "No, it's not. It's Tiana." And it's like <laughs> so. I've tried to accept the fact that it's her name, she ought to know how to pronounce it, but I, I, I really can't get past that. And, uh... Is there any, uh, do, do you have any idea whether your father has read the book or that would ever be available for him to read? Um, I don't know. Well, and there's several reasons for this. One is that he's only allowed to read books in Chinese that have been published in China. So unless the, our book is tra <laughs> translated into Chinese and published in China, there would be no way he would be able to access it. And also, um, be because um, some of my letters to him are also censored, I don't actually know if he knows about um, the fact that the book is published. Yeah. When, I, uh, when, the, when the book uh, was published a few months ago, I happened to be invited to a large reception at the Chinese em embassy um, in my capacity as post editor, not author, right around the same time. And um, one of the diplomats, the Chinese diplomats there saw me and 
had heard us on All Things Considered and said, oh, I've ordered your book. I said, oh, great, maybe you can help us get it translated into Chinese. And he said, that will never happen. <laughs> but I don't agree. I, I, uh, I think it will happen someday. And, and you know, we, I hope we will at least get it translated in Taiwan or Hong Kong, um, and then more people can read it in Chinese. Sir? Yes, uh, I commend you for that really moving story. Here's a question. Why would the United States uh, give most favored nation status to China when China is continuing to be uh, guilty of all of these grotesque human rights abuses? And uh, we don't read too much, but a little bit about tens of thousands of events throughout the country involving uh, police intervention, most of them related to a horrendous air and water pollution incidents and so on. Uh, I'm just thinking that the United States has been uh, abetting this kind of activity uh, rather than doing something else. So is there some other course you'd recommend? I, I, I think that's a great question. And uh, I, I'm old enough to have been on the Post editorial board uh, when Congress voted most favored nation status um, for China. And I remember our debates about it. And the argument um, at the time, which we in the end supported, was that um, it was more likely that China would gradually evolve into a freer place uh, if it had more um, contact with the world and more trade and more interchange. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that's still a reasonable proposition. Um, I, you know, I think there's no question that China today for most Chinese is a much freer place uh, than it was, you know, certainly 15 or 20 years ago. And that uh, the economic growth has been amazing. More people have moved out of poverty in China than in any other country in any other time in the history of the world. And so, you know, I think those of us who are uh, critical of, of China's human rights policies have to keep that in mind. The freedom, of course, stops when you come to criticizing the government or take, taking on the idea of one party rule. And I think the disappointment from uh, 10 years ago, I would just say is that, you know, there was kind of an assumption that political freedom would automatically follow economic freedom. And that, especially in the age of the internet, uh, there was there was no way that a one-party state could keep control uh, in the way that uh, the party pretty much has. Um, I think the mistake, from my point of view, has not been in granting most favored nation status, but in not adjusting to that surprise. Not when, when the, our assumption, which was a reasonable assumption after the fall of the Soviet Union and the spread of the internet, and that you know, democracy was inevitable. That over the last 20 years when we've seen it's maybe not inevitable and that the autocrats have pushed back, I think that democracies have been slow to readjust to that. And while I certainly would not propose you know, revoking most favored nation status or, or you know, ending trade with China, I do think there are things the United States government could do to put human rights higher up on, on the agenda with China. And I think it would be in China's interest because in the long run, I, I think any country will have a very hard time developing into a fully prosperous nation uh, unless the political freedoms do follow along with the economic ones. I don't know, do you want to add to that? Or? I'm curious about why you wrote it as a as a young adult novel, why whether why you chose that audience. Um, <clears throat> but there are a couple different answers to that. Not all of them probably so admirable. Um, one is that I had written. I have th we have three children, uh, and I had written two children's books, sort of for the first two kids, and never managed to write a third one uh, for our third child, and by the time I came to it, he was too old for a picture book. Uh, so <clears throat> I thought if he was not going to grow up feeling totally unloved, um, 
I should try to do something appropriate for his age. Um, that's one answer. A second answer is uh, that having read, you know, young adult literature when I was hugely important to me as a kid, you know, the Narnia books and, and um, uh, then reading the newer young adult fiction with my children as they um, started to grow up, I was just amazed at how, you know, there's just such high quality stuff and it's very inspiring and um, I thought, wow, I would love to try and write something, you know, I can't be in the league of Golden Compass, but um, it, it, it's something to shoot for. And then, you know, the third one was, I thought, um, kids, there are a lot of young people who are interested in the world, who would be interested in these issues, who might even be interested in getting engaged in some of these issues, um, if you could present it to them in a way that they could relate to and that was captivating. And um, so I thought uh, um, that was worth a shot also. Sir. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Uh, I did not read the book, but I'm very interested. Miss in Snyder will mark you down, but okay. okay. <laughs> I, I really interested in your description of the struggle or the hard road to democracy in China, Korea, and there was another country. Russia. And Russia. Uh, I am originally from Egypt. From Egypt. Do you think the struggles happening in Egypt now are on the way to democracy or away from democracy? Um, I, I, I will say um, that my experience having been a correspondent in, uh, I was a correspondent in Asia where for many years the experts said democracy was not possible. Democracy was not going to come to Korea because, and they had a lot of very convincing reasons. It was a Confucian society, it's too hierarchical, uh, rice based agriculture, you know, creates a stratified society. And, um, it turned out that, you know, people in Japan and then Korea and Taiwan and Indonesia and the Philippines and Thailand and all these countries where many experts said it was impossible, it turned out that uh, people in those countries really did want the dignity of self-determination and have succeeded, you know, for the most part in achieving it. And of course, in fashioning democratic systems that are different from America's and Canada's and Britain's, but nonetheless uh, represent the, the voice of the people. And then I went to Russia and, uh, you know, the same thing. There were a lot of people who said, well, the history of serfdom and uh, uh, the czar and, you know, it, Russia can never be democratic and people don't want democracy and they're just jealous of their neighbors and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, uh, once again, I was there in a period where it was very clear that many Russians really did and I think do want democracy. Uh, some of the republics of the former Soviet Union have done better than others on that road. Um, but <clears throat> I, I don't think it's, you know, and culture is part of it, but culture is not determinant. So when I came back to this country, and I'm not an expert in the Middle East, but when I heard people say, well, Arabs will never have democracy and they're not capable of democracy, or Islam is incompatible with democracy, I tend to be very skeptical of that, those kinds of uh, sweeping statements. And um, when the Arab Spring started uh, in Tunisia, you know, to me it was a reflection that uh, in fact these things that we think are universal and are shared from South Africa to India to Burma, those feelings exist in Tunisians too and I think in Egyptians too. Um, so. In the long run, I'm optimistic. Uh, you know, I think it's hard in Egypt, uh, you know, the questions of when you have Islamist parties that think they know the one true way, uh, it makes it difficult uh, to have multi-party democracy. And, you know, in all these countries, uh, it's hard and economics make it hard. And, you know, I think 
the world, the United States and Europe, were not as supportive in 2011 and 2012 as we might have been, as we were with Eastern Europe, uh, because we were distracted with our own recession and people were feeling like, isn't it time to come home? And so a little bit, I feel like there was an opportunity lost, uh, but I think the story is very much unfinished. And uh, I, I, I certainly would not give, you know, I've met a lot of incredibly brave Democrats from Egypt and uh, I would not give up on them. Yes. I'm sorry. Thanks to both of you, a very inspiring story. Uh, one question, I meet Chinese people every day in my work and people coming from China. They're extremely apolitical. They kind of refuse to speak politics. They don't even seem to be concerned about political freedom, even not just people from China, but people from Taiwan almost taking it to me, saying that, well, democracy is not working too well for him, is it? Is it true? Or am I seeing something where they are afraid to speak rather than being apolitical? Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, Tiana is more of an expert than I am. I, um, <clears throat> I'd say a couple of things. I'd say, you know, everybody, I, I, I mean, it's normal that what you really care about in life, 98% of the time, is not the election, or is there gonna be, unless you happen to work for the federal government, is there gonna be a budget shutdown? You know, we all have busy lives and kids and jobs, and so uh, ideally, you know, politics is something that we can get involved in if we want to, but that enables people to lead lives that, that they wanna pursue, that, and, and so I don't think it's abnormal to not be obsessed by politics. I would say that's number one. Number two, um, I am always careful and a, a little skeptical when people tell me, I don't mean you, but oh, the Chinese people feel this way or the Egyptian people feel that way or the uh, Uzbek people don't want democracy. Because in fact, if you are living in a place where it's very terrifying to uh, express, uh, an opinion, then one shouldn't expect those folks to answer public opinion polls naturally. And, um, and you know, the third thing is uh, security, of course, is people's first concern, and economics is a concern, and Chinese people have been extremely, you know, working hard to come up from very low economic status and from, you know, just being destroyed by this crazy cultural revolution, and, and there's, they've had a lot of work to do. So all of that, you know, says that I, I don't think you can ever expect the majority of a country to come out in the street and, and demonstrate for human rights. But, you know, I think if you look at the history of Taiwan, it shows that a lot of people there were willing to take risks and make sacrifices for democracy. I'm sure a lot of Taiwanese are not any more satisfied with their democracy than we are with ours, and we all have our reasons. But you know, they show that when the Chinese government in Beijing says democracy is a Western implant and it's not compatible with Asia, well, Taiwan shows that's not true. And, um, uh, you know, I think my guess would be a lot of people would very much rather be able to choose their leaders, throw corrupt people out of office when they could. Uh, but, you know, if you have a job and you have kids, a normal person is not going to take the huge risks that Tiana's father took. Um, and, you know, how many of us would? So I, that's not a complete answer, maybe. But Thank you. And yeah. best wishes for the post. I hope to get it at my door for next years to come. Absolutely. <laughs> Hello. Um, this is for Tiana. Uh, I'm a fellow Canadian, born and raised in Montreal. Oh, nice to meet you. <laughs> Thank you, same here. It's an honor to hear your story. I'm wondering how we can be of help to you and your father. This is something that I feel most moved by and... <laughs> Sorry. And, and wondering if you can share with us anything that you know that we can do to be of supportive to your quest 
to free your father. Okay, well, thank you so much for your offer for help. Um, I think, well, one thing is just to um, become familiar with the case and realize that, um, you know, that he's not uh, alone in this. You know, there's like, I have countless friends, you know, other daughters whose father are also um, locked away in prison in China. So I think the first step is just, you know, awareness. And um, I think there's also a lot of conversations that come up sometimes talking about Chinese human rights issues. And um, I think for some people, this is, what's happening now is still um, hard to believe. For to some people who haven't heard it, let's say directly from me or my friends. Um, so being able to sharing that story, you know, using this ex as an example um, to, you know, give this give the human rights abuse cri the crisis um, some credibility um, would be a good first step. And then the second, obviously, I mean, you can go on the website that I have for my dad. It's wangbingjung.org, and there's like um, one of web page of ways you can help. You can uh, write directly to him. Um, he doesn't actually get any of the letters, but it's good to know. It's good for the prison to know that outsiders care. Um, you can write to your representative, and you can write to the Chinese embassy. Um, it's really difficult to say what's actually useful, but none of these things hurt. Fred, I'd like to ask you, uh, in your journalistic capacity, um, in the last 10 days, we've seen Putin, uh, President Putin use the New York Times to address the American people, and just recently in the Post, um, the president of Iran do the same. How do you think about this um, uh, when repressive government leaders use the fourth estate to make their case to the American people? Do you edit them? Do you look for PR points versus yeah. sincerity, et cetera? That, that's a, a good question. Um, you know, I, I look at the op-ed page as uh, up, uh, at, of the Washington Post as a place that should have a range of views um, from left to right and uh, American and foreign. And, um, you know, it's true that you could say, well, President Rouhani was free to write what he wanted in the Post and, you know, we really didn't edit. I might edit for clarity, but I, you know, certainly didn't edit anything to change his meaning or challenge him. Uh, you know, why do we let him do that when everything in Iran would be censored? Um, my feeling is it's useful for Americans to hear what he has to say. American readers are um, smart enough to evaluate it. And I have an op-ed page where people can then write and, you know, if they take issue with what the president of Iran has said, um, you know, we'll have a debate going on. And, and uh, rather than emulate Iran's press, I would like to set an example for them of how open debate should work. Um, now, you know, I have turned down op-eds from heads of state, uh, too, if they're just propaganda with no news value, if, you know, the president of, I won't name a country, says, uh, you know, we're doing great and it's a democracy and, you know, it's just not true. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that. And, and I have sometimes sent them back and said, well, you've just arrested this person and this person. How can you call yourself a democracy? Or if you want to call yourself a democracy, you have to at least answer that in the piece. And sometimes they'll engage, and sometimes they'll take it to the New York Times. You know. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I thought the Rouhani piece was you know, interesting. And, and obviously, at this moment uh, of possible change in US-Iranian relations, news, newsworthy, too. So. Yeah, we have time for just a couple more, I think. Sorry, my question is for Tiana. Is that correct, Tiana? Yeah. <laughs> Tiana, I work with students every day um, from a variety of different cultures, and I was wondering, um, for us adults and also for the children, how would like, what would you say affected you the most or gave you the presence of mind to come here to work in these lobbying, that sorts of things? I would never have thought to do that at 19. Um, to come to fight for your father in all these ways 
as a young woman, and then also to have the resilience to continue to persevere despite all the obstacles that you have encountered? Um, well, I think it's actually a good thing that I was born and raised in Canada because I didn't really know anything about DC, and I think not knowing anything was a good thing. <laughs> um, I really had no idea what I was doing. So, um, and I think in that, when I was 19, that worked to my advantage. So. I, basically, I didn't really know what there was to be afraid of, so I just came thinking, oh, well, what could I lose? And um, in terms of continuing, well, um, I mean, it is really difficult because um, it, it's really hard to, like, measure any kind of success because, uh, well, as so long as my father is in prison, there's really no w way of thinking that... I mean, it's just hard to say that anything I've done has been beneficial. In fact, sometimes I wonder if it's actually detrimental. I mean, we, because I, you know, since I've been more outspoken about my father, I don't get visas to go to China, and my letters are being censored. And so um, it's it is really tough to keep going. But I guess not doing anything is worse of the two. And inaction would eat at my conscience. So um, I don't really feel like it's... Uh, I don't really feel like it's a choice sometimes. And also, um, I think that in the past 10 years of my father's imprisonment, I've also had the privilege of um, getting an education that one doesn't get in school. Uh, I get to meet um, other individuals who lived through persecution in China, and I you know, befriended people who've been tortured, and people who've escaped, and people who live as re political refugees in North America. And um, these individuals um, really remind me that what I'm doing is part of something bigger than just trying to win my father's release. And so they make me feel like it is sort of like my responsibility to keep going. I guess we have time for one last, last question. Uh, sure. This is for Tiana as well. I'm wondering what your experiences have been with the U.S. government with uh, petitioning for your father's release. Um, it's really difficult and especially, I mean, when I was here, I was, the, I spent one year in D.C. and that was just sort of getting started learning the ropes of how, you know, the American government works. And then I went going, now I'm, well, after that I went back to Mont Canada to go to university. And it's really difficult not being here um, because if you don't put pressure like every single day, it's just so easily swept behind, you know, hundreds of other equally deserving, uh, you know, issues that require attention. So it's really difficult. I feel like I have to be um, really on top of it to get any sort of, um, t for there to be any sort of effect, yeah. So um, I just want to thank the interpreters. I, I look so eloquent. I really love it. <laughs> uh, and uh, thank you all very much for coming. We really appreciate it. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.